bringing order to the intersection of public, private, and civic. This is Infrastructure Momentum Makers. Welcome to Infrastructure Momentum Makers, presented by Ansarada, the only software solution purpose-built to securely run complex and high-value infrastructure procurement. All your infrastructure procurement processes in one place, all in order. And join me, Vratna Amin, as I speak with the movers and shakers at the intersection of the public, private, and civic sectors about the latest breakthroughs and developments in the world of infrastructure. Today, I'm very happy to be joined by the newly appointed Chief Innovation Officer at Los Angeles Metro. And she's also the former General Manager of the Los Angeles Department of Transportation, Salida Reynolds. Salida is here to talk about her role at LA Metro, plus some of the exciting projects the agency is working on and how they're endeavoring to make Los Angeles transportation more accessible and available. Thanks so much for joining us, Salida. Well, welcome, Salida. Great to have you on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. I have known you for a long time and it's been just amazing to watch your journey. I know so many of us have been watching your journey. There's something really special about you and how you've been able to keep moving and be a leader and stay accessible. For a lot of us women, like you're a model of an executive so I really just want to ask about that right off the bat. Like, what do you feel like your impact has been on the field as a, a leader in this in transportation in the public sector? Oh, cool. We're just starting with like a like a light, like an easy question, like a light. <laughs> I'm sure you've been asked about this before. So I have, although I have to say, first of all, it's really difficult to see yourself the, the way others see you and to, to know the truth about yourself. And second, it's difficult to know um, what hindsight will be on the work that you've done, you know. So I'm always just trying to stay curious and open and be out in the world and be listening and and he- be open to viewpoints that are radically different from mine and then try and keep a really firm North Star about the things that are most important to me in the work that I do and and hope that's really all all I can do. But I, I will say, you know, I remember I was up on a stage at WTS when it was in Austin, Texas, several years ago. And, it w- and I was up oh WTS stand for Women's Transportation Seminar. And it's an industry organization created to support women's growth in the field of of transportation and to support and and really nurture the the future leaders and of course it's it's open to men and women because our success is a should be a collective responsibility because it benefits everybody when women are successful but i was up on that stage with Polly Trottenberg who is at the time was the New York City DOT commissioner and some other sort of really big names um Leslie Richards who runs uh, SEPTA in Pennsylvania, and Robin Hutchison, who at the time was running the Salt Lake City DOT. And so there were a lot of of very powerful women on that stage. And I was telling a story about when I moved from the city of Seattle to San Francisco, and I have two daughters, and my youngest one, I was pregnant with her when I actually accepted the job in San Francisco, and my mother had moved to Seattle where we were living in order to be closer to her grandchildren when I got the call from um, Bridget Smith about the position at the SFMTA. And at the time, I was in the private sector, but I really was feeling a tug to go back to the public sector. And I got very emotional when I was talking about the advice that my mother gave me because I called her and it was one of the most difficult conversations I've ever had to have. You know, she moved to be closer to her grandchildren, and here I was leaving not long after she had gotten there. And she's, she told me, look, if you don't take this job, then I will have failed as your mother because I raised you to be independent, to chase your dreams, to go after the things that you care about. I'm getting emotional again. <laughs> because it's just such a powerful expression of love. And afterwards, I remember talking to Bridget Smith about it and saying, I was so, I'm so embarrassed. i you know, showed emotion on that stage. I cried on that stage. And she said, no, that's that's actually really important 
for women to see that it is okay to bring vulnerability and to bring emotional intelligence and to really bring your whole self into a very public position and a role and a leadership role because that's really where you know the, seeing that will invite more women to feel comfortable stepping into leadership because that's one of the superpowers that we have is our ability to really connect to our own vulnerability and to bring that empathy into the work that we do. And so I hope that of, you know, of all the things that I could point to and say, you know, it'd really be great if I was someday known for X, Y, or Z, the projects are are amazing and I love them, but that's really what I hope. I hope that there was somebody in that audience that saw me do that and that then felt like, oh, she's just a normal person and she has feelings and it's okay to express them. And maybe that I can I can step into leadership too. And I don't have to feel like I have to keep my emotions balled up or that it's not okay to bring those into your work. And so in you were asking about the generational shift in women leaders. And, and I hope that that's a generational shift, not just for, for women who lead, but also for people of color, other marginalized groups that have not been allowed into leadership that, you know, there's a new model emerging, and I'm certainly not the only version of it, that is more welcoming to a broader array of people and that those leadership positions feel accessible and that they feel doable to folks um, because we cannot continue to have a, you know, homogenous sort of thought in leadership and transportation or any other field because we won't solve the problems in front of us if everybody at the top looks and thinks the same. Oh, Selena, what an incredible set of ideas there. I'm really touched by that as a working mother myself. And it's easy to get mixed messages from your family or to interpret mixed messages about a woman's career. Like, oh, no, stay home with the kids so I can enjoy them, too. And versus ambition. Yeah, mom guilt is real. It's real. It's confusing. And uh, but I think what I hear is like to be open to, to a different perspective that actually may be. First of all, you decide what's best, but that other people do want you to achieve your dreams. So thank you for that. Yes, and to focus on those people. Focus on the people in your corner. It is also, I think every single one of us has an inner critic. And, you know, that inner critic sometimes mirrors back what we hear from detra our detractors or people in the, who don't want us to succeed or people who think we're too much or we're too loud or we're doing too much or our ideas are bad or... We don't have the right bona fides to be at the table, but every single one of us has a lot of folks who are in our own corner. And it's really, I think, a practice and a habit to think about them and what they want for us when we're when we're feeling kind of low. Oh, I know so many people are going to be stoked to hear that, Salita. It's so encouraging. <laughs> well, let's get to your, your so-called job, even though what you just said, being a leader is is your whole, you know, what you show up for, but more specifically what you do at LA Metro. So you are the newly appointed chief innovation officer at Los Angeles Metro. For people who don't know, you came from the Los Angeles Department of Transportation. You were the general manager there. For people who don't know, can you quickly explain the difference between LA DOT and LA Metro? And maybe also like the difference in scale and budget we're talking about. Yeah, LA is a really giant region and and like the Bay Area or other sort of big metropolitan regions, it is kind of impenetrable to folks from the outside to understand the complexities of its governance. But the city of Los Angeles obviously is huge, 4 million people. The the budget for LADOT was about half a billion dollars on an annual basis and about half of that money comes from outside the city and half of it comes from inside the city. Uh, it has 52 business lines. It is an implementing and operational agency. I also think of LADOT and really any public agency that deals with transportation and public dollars as an investor in both the infrastructure that we build, but also the companies that help us build that infrastructure. We've sort of entered the digital age. The sort of need for a shift in the way that we think about ourselves has grown even greater. But LA Metro is at the county scale. 
The county has 88 cities in it. So one of those is the city of Los Angeles, but there are 87 others. Some of them are, you know, they punch above their weight in terms of the resources they have and what they bring to the table. So city of Santa Monica is a separate city, but it's obviously in this very critical place in the region. They're at the coast and there's all sorts of issues there that they have to grapple with. And they have a lot of uh, transit that LA Metro manages that comes to and from Santa Monica that serves a critical purpose. LA Metro, you know, just to get a sense of what they're dealing with in terms of their budget, they operate the the rail and the bus line, the bus service in the in the region. There are municipal operators and other smaller transit operators that provide service as well. But Metro is the major provider of those services. But Metro also is charged with the responsibility to manage part of the highway system as well. So Metro manages the express lanes, for all intents and purposes, the tolling authority, the sales tax measure that the voters in LA County voted for uh, back in 2018, Measure M, is a $40 billion sales tax measure that goes over 20 years. So the scale of the the money just from that one sales tax measure is, it's pretty uh, incredible. 11,000 employees, which includes the transit operators, whereas LADOT is about, you know, hovers anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 employees. So, you know, it went from kind of being at the top of an agency that had uh, a huge sort of footprint to being at the, having a smaller role in a bigger organization and also a very different role the chief innovation officer's portfolio includes a lot of really interesting things. We're in charge of putting together the plan for the 28 Olympic and Paralympic Games. We're also responsible for the agency's strategic plan. We're responsible for a congestion pricing study and coming up with new ways for people to pay and access the various transit services in the region. We also take in a lot of ideas from the private sector through unsolicited proposals. And so all of those things are, you know, those are all big things, but there isn't one single one of them where everybody responsible for the implementation of those things is in my team. Almost all of them involve uh, providing support or influencing or managing sideways other implementing teams inside LA Metro. So it really is a coordination role, collaboration role, consensus building role, and kind of an organizing role. That's another way that I don't know that we always think about our jobs in transportation. We don't think about ourselves as organizers, but we absolutely have a collective power that only comes when we build coalitions and pull people together. And so I think that's the other part of the the role that I have now. Oh, that's such an interesting point about needing to be an organizer. I was on the advisory council for the chief innovation office when it started, and it's really amazing to see how much the scope has grown, which I think speaks to the need for a place that is an organizer, coordinator, but maybe doesn't have a huge bureaucracy of its own, but has a skill set to bring people to the table and keep things moving across departments, which I think is a growing need across agencies. Can you tell us a little bit more about what an average day or week is like for you in this role in the chief innovation office? Oh, sure. So let's see. This week, I presented to the senior leadership team, which is all of the chief executives at Metro plus their direct reports, uh, presented to them an idea that we have about something called a visionary seed fund that we want to make available to the region. So trying to figure out what should the theme around that call be, who's eligible, how can we begin to get people excited about it? So presented that for input and feedback and then participated and, and had feedback in the agency's gender action plan that they uh, have brought forward to the board for their consideration. I also went to the city of Compton to participate in a business roundtable. So, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners down in, in Compton come together on a quarterly basis and, and have presentations from different uh, entities in the region. And so I was there representing Metro to get to just take a pulse, see what's going on down there, see what they're thinking about when it comes to transportation and mobility. And then, you know, I also have uh, meetings about the 28 games. So uh, there's a group called the Games Management Executives, and that includes LADOT, Caltrans, Metrolink. These are all the major transportation providers in this region, along with LA28, which is the local organizing committee. 
And we're working to come up with a list of projects that we think need to be delivered to make the games work. And so that's obviously a, both a technical and a political process. So going through going through those things. But I also have two daughters. They have uh, one of them's a pitcher, the other's a catcher. So they've got softball practice twice a week for fall ball, which isn't as, as big of a deal as spring ball, but they really love to play. So there's those kinds of things happening as well in the, in the background. And then Metro has a, a hybrid work policy. So, you know, one day I might be at home. Most days I'm actually in the office. Uh, Representative uh, Peter DeFazio from Oregon, who's been a longtime chair of the House Transportation Infrastructure Committee, came to Metro for a visit. So participated in that presentation to talk about, again, the games and how the uh, U.S. government might uh, step in and help out. So it's kind of a, you know, things large and small, trying to move initiatives forward and and also trying to balance, you know, home and home and work. I think that's amazing. And it's really cool how you can probably connect all those systems. You're, what you're doing at home with your kids, Compton, 28 to 28. These are all part of one picture for you, I imagine. Yeah. And there's the inside the building work and the outside the building work, right? The inside the building work at Metro, as I see it, is the work of creating a culture that does prioritize collaboration, that does break silos, that does apply creativity and joy to the work that we do. And then there's the outside the building work, which is making sure that, you know, we're advocating for the region and getting, you know, dollars for transportation, but also being in the community and making sure that I'm I'm out there uh, listening, because one of the facts about being in transportation and, and urban planning in general is that this industry is responsible for creating a lot of harm, and, and some of it unintentional and some of it intentional, specifically through a lens of racism, cutting Black and brown communities off from opportunity, and generally leaving them out of decision-making and communications and power and funding. I've been in this field now for almost 25 years. So that means that, you know, even though I was well-intentioned, there's probably projects that I did that created harm in those communities because I had and have a lot to learn. And so part of this job is being out in the world and listening with humility and atoning for things when you can, even if it wasn't your fault, even if you weren't the one who made those decisions, that's an important, that's an important part of, of any transportation planner and urban planner's work. And anybody who's not including that in their work is missing out on a lot of very incredible opportunities, both for learning to open up the door to allow people to share things that they might not share if there's no trust and if they don't think that you understand kind of what their day-to-day -day reality is. And there's also missed opportunities then for creativity, for really inviting in and hearing ideas that can come from anywhere about how to make the system work better for everyone who's currently left out of it. That's really powerful as well, Salita, that personal commitment to atonement and to learning is a really valuable call, and I hope people listening hear that. You mentioned the 28 to 28 program, and I kind of remember when that was launched, and it was very smart and clever and involved state legislation to move forward a bunch of projects in advance of the Olympics. That also happened in what feels like another era completely. It was before COVID. It was before all this unrest and hopefully growing awareness of racism and the uh, environmental harms that have come with that and now climate emergency. What kind of changes are happening to 28 to 28? It's, it's an interesting example of an evolving transportation project that with an extremely big price tag and a lot of commitments that have already been made. Back then, right, when it, the mayor, it was really Mayor Garcetti and the Metro Board that put forward this 28 by 28 framing around what the region could would, would strive to deliver by the 28 games. And of course, you know, anytime you put out a list of projects, it is inherently political, right? You're no longer, it's technical in nature, but it's also political in nature. 
And it it was, I think, as you correctly described it, a call to action. 28 by 28 was a call to action. Regionally, can the agencies get together? Can we row hard in the same direction? Can we inspire the federal government to invest in these projects, et cetera? And then COVID happened, and really every every agency, every transportation agency that I know of in this region converted almost it overnight into an emergency response agency, right? We repurpose bus fleets at LADOT and Metro to do things like deliver food to seniors and move unhoused folks indoors and consider, you know, how to bring people to vaccination sites eventually, but also to testing sites and changing the Dodger Stadium parking lot into the largest testing site I think in the US, that was all the work that was happening. And then, you know, we, as we're sort of emerging, I won't say we've emerged, but we're emerging. Now everybody is sort of, you know, kind of recovered a little bit from that moment of emergency to see that there's another huge task before us. And in looking at that list of 28 projects, it's very clear that many of them advanced much farther than they would have absent that call to action. But it's also the time to recognize that that list was a stretch goal. It was an ambitious list. And now we have to turn our attention to the practical realities now that it's much closer about what can really be accomplished. And so I think what you'll see in the in the shift as we begin to move forward is that there's a much, much heavier emphasis on, for example, building out a set of bus only lanes in the region that might be a legacy, you know, leave behind. When we do those quick build projects where we allocate a lane just for bus buses and we change traffic signal timing and we make other changes to infrastructure to make the, the bus more optimal and efficient, that is the little seed that begins to make the bus more attractive, more time competitive, and overall just more effective at moving large numbers of people that can potentially stick after the games are over. So there's certainly been a shift. And I think to your point about, you know, 2017 and how we thought about transportation then and how we think about it now, the Metro board has been very clear that equity and specifically specific investment in communities that have been overlooked and underinvested in, that that is a criteria for how we prioritize these projects going forward. So equity also, you know, an access to the games and, and making sure that they're really going to help effectively move people to that huge event be a legacy. So is the project something that can be delivered by 2028, but still have lasting positive effects in the region? So things like the Sepulveda, there's a giant project to like tunnel through a mountain called the Sepulveda Pass, which is this longstanding infrastructure project that's very needed in the region it's very, it's unlikely that given where that project is now, it will be done in time for the games. So that's a project that was on the 28 by 28 list that, that you know, we've, we've moved on from. But I think what you'll see is that now we have a list of actually 48 projects that are, are much more surgical in nature. They will require a lot of public outreach and a lot of community engagement to bring to life. We've got a lot of urgency around now turning our attention to those projects. That's really interesting and encouraging actually to hear about change and revisiting things. I think that's um, been hard for a lot of agencies and the stakeholders that raised the money and got the first legislation through or something like that, but really critical. Yours, you, you mentioned switching to more of a community engagement mode, moving the project forward. I imagine, Slita, there's a difference in, between what people ask for every day in terms of improvements to their transportation system, to their public transit, what you heard in Compton, and the agency's needs to move these big projects forward that are longer term in nature, that are harder for individual people maybe to fathom the benefits of. How do you balance those two? How do you keep representing the big projects that might not meet, meet people's needs in the immediate future? Yeah, and they, they might not even be big projects, right? When you go into a neighborhood and you say, I'm, I'm you know, here to build a protected bike lane or I'm here to build a bus lane and that means I have to take a lane that's currently dedicated to vehicle traffic and convert it to something else. That's not usually at the top of the list of some communities. Some, some communities it is for sure. I don't want to paint everybody with one brush, but it may not be, right? And that's, there's a trap there which is that tendency for particularly folks who work in technical fields 
that are steeped in data and analysis that use incredibly sophisticated tools to make determinations about where to put the bike lane and where to put the bus lane that look at things like crash records and safety and where people are coming from and going to and all of this very intense research that underpins these recommendations that also, by the way, are are trying to get to a place where we have cleaner air, we're able to survive climate catastrophes, and we're able to, to really give people economic mobility who currently don't have it because they can't afford a car. There's a trap there to come in and say, look, I've got all this, I've done all this analysis, I've got all of this information, and I know best, and here it is. And then to become extremely frustrated when, you know, the neighborhood that you're speaking to is completely uninterested in any of that and has a long list of other things that they need from you as the transportation agency, whether you're at the city or the county or the state level, that aren't on your list. And there's this mismatch that happens all the time. And there's a sometimes a danger. I think uh, it's heightened in the sort of post-2020 era of even particularly planners and engineers thinking, oh, well, actually, I have access to power. I have this position. I'm going to come in and I'm going to rain down projects on this community, right, which is very challenging. And I think that all of that arises from the fact that the last 20 years or so, a lot of folks who are coming into transportation are coming in through the climate door. They're they're in transportation because they're desperately trying to, to combat the effects of driving, And transportation accounts for, you know, 30 to 40 percent, depending on who you listen to, of the emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions. And so the natural conclusion of folks is, well, people have to drive less. And for people to drive less, I've got to, number one, make it harder to drive. And number two, make it easier to take other modes. It's or And I have to also electrify all the fleet that's on the road right now. What that misses entirely (laughs) is just how critical it is right now for people's lives to be able to drive. We've done a really poor job of kind of understanding the role of the car in American life. And a lot of that relates to land use and the way that we've planned and laid out cities make it almost impossible to get access to jobs or education or even just to take your kids to school without owning a car. And so that's kind of, you know, you're asking about like when you go out and people are asking for one, you're there to deliver one thing and you actually have a lot of money. You're actually committed to deliver one thing But then people are asking for a whole bunch of other things. And my approach to that has always been to first and foremost, set my project aside and listen carefully and closely and see if I can find some wins for communities that are feeling disenfranchised, overlooked, et cetera. If there are, even if it's not my agency or if it's not in my purview or I don't have funding for it, In order to be successful at delivering a transportation system that serves everybody, their worries have to be my worries. There has to be a way. Maybe I'm not able to give them everything on their punch list, but I can at least give it a go. And and I can, by the way, also show up for them when they need help connecting to somebody to talk about housing or, or, or advocating for something that's not related to transportation directly but that we have a uh, sort of mutual interests. So I think that's just the the best way to go about doing it. I've never seen it succeed if you try and skip that step or if you even if you have a the political will to go and put in a project that a community is not asking for or that they're really concerned about, it usually backfires. So that first step and looking for for ways to use your power to get community the wins that it wants before you come in with your project, I think is the best way to to think about it. I hope a lot of people in this field are listening to this. I'll make sure that they do. Speaking of atonement, I worked in consulting too, which is kind of the big source of a lot of that technical information. And also a lot of folks who don't see the ability to respond to anything else. Like I've just, I just work on this project. They're asking for X, Y, and Z. I, I can't hear that. I can't do anything about it. And I I disagree with that. I think we need to change that structure so everybody feels empowered. The other thing I heard in what you're saying, Salida, is to believe what people are saying. They're speaking their truth about what's hard and they have authority. 
in their own lives, in their own neighborhood, their own travel journeys more than somebody who doesn't experience that. Yeah, I would I would love to see us change job qualifications to include lived experience. Like maybe you need a degree in this or you have lived experience in some particular arena that we start to value community expertise the same way we value technical expertise. And by the way, there are a lot of other fields that could probably enrich what we're thinking about and doing, you know, behavioral psychology, even anthropology, history, bringing those pieces into what we do and trying to figure out if there's nobody around me that can give me some of those reality checks, then something's wrong about the way that I've been a gatekeeper on who can access um, these positions in, in this profession. And so I think there's a, an, it, that is a, I would say a radical idea that probably feels a little bit scary, but I just, I have to believe that it would create really a lot of, of, it would be a catalyst for a lot of overdue change in the way that we think about and approach our projects. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I've felt that social work is a really essential skill in this field, both for the inside game and the outside game, how to help people yeah. one by one have self-efficacy and access resources. Another one I talk about a lot is training and process, how to move people from point A to point B using well-known practices, but that might come from a lot of different fields of group work mm -hmm. and teamwork and organizing, as you stated before. Yes, totally. I think, you know, right now we're in the middle in this country of a massive bus transit operator shortage that's being felt across the board. It's starting to recover a little bit, but there's no reason for me. I mean, we were dealing with a, a transit operator shortage at LEDOT before the pandemic. It's only gotten worse. Even if we have an all hands on deck approach and we're able to, you know, bring people into that field, unless we figure out a career ladder for folks, um, I don't think we won't keep them there, right? There's those rarities and those transit operators that have 20, 30, 40 years of experience, but not nearly enough of those. And that's because that job is physically, emotionally, and mentally taxing. And it's not really a job that most people should do for long periods of time. But we haven't really figured out what is that career ladder for folks. And this applies to parking enforcement, traffic control officers, and probably a lot of other places where we struggle to bring people on board. But here's a bunch of folks in our own backyard that are experts <laughs> on, you know, really what's going on out there and what people really need and what would be most valuable. We should be able to find a way to bring them into the decision-making rooms, those of them that want to. Not everybody wants to and not everybody needs to, and that's fine. But right now that ladder doesn't exist unless you are a very strong advocate for yourself and willing to invest a lot of your own time in educational attainment, other things to, to reach those minimum qualifications that are listed under almost every job. Description. That's a great example of barriers between classes of people, I would say. There's a classism yes. that you can see in this field between folks who do the operations on the ground serving the public and those who are in more technical roles or leadership roles. What will it take to overcome that? What is the barrier or the, like the mental model that's the barrier here or just bureaucratic to maybe overcoming what you just said, having more of the operator voice and expertise in the room yeah. for decision making? Yeah, there's a great writer and I'm blanking on his name, but he's done a lot of, of investigation on at what point in the United States did we begin to value that sort of technical expertise and technical fields that are, are I'll put this in quotes, sort of intellectual in nature uh, or, you know, rely more on mental acuity versus some of those professions that are skilled trade or even, you know, people who do all variety of work, right? People who are servers in restaurants, people who cut hair, people who, you know, work in, people who are mechanics, right? At what point did we relegate that group of of that segment of work, did we did we decide to devalue it in the way that we clearly, very clearly have? And how can we recover from that? And I think part of it is, you know, it's a system, it's a systems problem. So it goes pretty deep all the way back to, 
you know, think about the the stereotype of, you know, uh, high school students that are that are in shop, right? And who who goes in and takes shop versus who's in, you know, AP calculus. Like it starts then and then sort of proceeds from there. And that's pretty outrageous in terms of how we value and think about that work and how we connect that to happiness and fulfillment. Because really doing work the work you do is really about bringing value to your life. If the pandemic taught us anything and gave us any lessons about how incredibly short our time is, how very interconnected we are, and what the point is of the time that we spend here together, it is that we should spend our time doing things that bring meaning into our lives and bring the meaning into those lives around us that allow us to be better humans and and share love. And we haven't really effectively figured out how we assign those classes. Uh, it, it gets in the way of that directly. So I do think it's probably a, I don't know if I have a great answer, but my, my starting point is, you know, why don't we have a, a set of classifications in the civil service system or in any big bureaucratic system that allow that kind of mobility back and forth between frontline work, skilled trade work, and desk work, or management work, or analysis work? And how can we recognize that those, to treat those as siloed has only gotten us into a, a sort of a mess that we have to break in order to get out of? I hope, again, people are listening, because that's going to take a lot of collective <laughs> effort to accomplish, you know, and people on a lot yes, of Yes, yes. But, and I would love to see that, right? I know that I, you're, are you still on the Transit Center board? Yes, I'm the chair of the Transit Center board, a foundation based in New York City. Excellent. I know Transit Center is, or at least the last conversation that I had with uh, David Bragdon and, and, and his colleagues there, your colleagues, about this exact challenge, right? And how can we, I think that advocacy organizations, nonprofits, academics, there's an opportunity here, at least in this, on our small corner of the universe even, just to come up with some recommendations and then to find a handful of public and private agencies that are willing to give them a shot and put them into practice uh, and then see what we find. I have a feeling we're going to find things that are that make our work better. But it is a it's a risk. It's a little bit risky. Right. It's a little scary. It's a little bit counterintuitive. It can feel sometimes we come to these conversations, whether it's about gender equity or racial equity or or, you know, accessibility or. Uh, with a scarcity mindset that somehow if we make it easier for other folks to get into the door, there will be less for the people who are already inside. And I just have always seen over and over again, the opposite is true. When you open the door wider, the room gets bigger and everybody benefits and everybody, you know, our field benefits. And then, you know, the cities that we serve benefit. So I, I think that mindset shift is also a really important part of the conversation from scarcity to abundance. Thank you for that. And one last question, Slito, before I let you go. Obviously, you're working very hard as a leader, a parent, and a community member in Los Angeles. But if you could get out and visit some infrastructure somewhere in the world, what's at the top of your list? So many things, Ratna. I think I would, so because I'm working on the games now, I would really like my, you know, I'd love to go look at the bus only infrastructure that Rio put in for their games and look at how much of it, you know, how did they, I want to like be able to sort of push the fast forward button and get a vision of what does LA look like in 2030 or 2035 and what are the legacy pieces of the games. And I think Rio is a really good model for that because they relied so heavily on their bus infrastructure and bus only infrastructure. And how did they evolve that and preserve that and advance that over time? I'm also interested in going in and poking around in, in Tokyo and, and understanding what kind of technology did they use to sort of make decisions about how to change things on the fly in real time as the sort of dynamic day-to-day -day reality of, of hosting the games set in. I think, you know, between Asia and South America, that would be that would be a pretty amazing trip. Yeah, I hope you get to do that soon. Salida, thank you so yeah, much for this time and also your voice and candor and willingness to call things out. Really grateful for this time. 
Yeah, me too, Ratna. Always fun to talk to you and good to have an opportunity to sort of talk about the deeper things that I don't get to talk a lot about in my in the day-to-day hustle. Take care, Salita. You too. Our guest today once again was Salita Reynolds with LA Metro in Los Angeles. Thanks so much for joining us, Salita, and sharing the exciting work your team is doing and discussing the incredible 28 to 28 program now underway. It's been a real pleasure. And thank you all once again for listening to our show. If you are enjoying it, please make sure to leave a review so more people can find us. Until next time, I'm Ratna Amin, and this has been Infrastructure Momentum Makers, presented by Ansarada. Thank you.